Like myself, he expected to simply be keeping the seat warm for a few weeks, in a period when nothing much was happening and he could carry on with his plans for a relaxing summer and autumn, visiting friends in the US and generally staying out of the limelight. <laughs> but it turned out not to be. Instead, he found himself described, by the Independent no less, as the most influential politician today. The Prime Minister apparently refuses to rule out awarding him a peerage, and Graham Brady, the chairman of the Conservative backbencher, says that it is hard to justify not doing so. Though he himself has said that he's keen at the moment, he's not that keen at the moment, and might think about it when he gets old. He was recently portrayed on the cover of The Economist alongside Vladimir Putin and Donald Trump as a trio of drum-beating revolutionaries and his image was exhibited at the National Portrait Gallery, much to the disgust of the evening standards. He's been denounced by Jeremy Corbyn as a rich white man and by Matthew Paris for having killed his faith in democracy. Before he had even left, he has this week been tipped in some media for a political comeback in 2017, along with Tony Blair, who is apparently funding and founding a new not-for-profit organisation, which is lovely of him, to expand the impact of his work in devising solutions to some of the world's most significant problems, among which he includes Nigel Farage, I should expect. The new statesman said that even without the vote for Brexit, Farage would have been one of the most transformative politicians of these turbulent times. And of course, the US president-elect has recently suggested that he may make an excellent ambassador to the United States. What do you think of that? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's not bad for a stand-in leader, is it? This really is our chance to say goodbye and thank you to a man who has personified this party, from its founding at the LSE in 1993 to the extraordinary position it finds itself in today. As a founding member of the party, its first by-election candidate and the first to retain his deposit, reluctant committee man, even more reluctant party chairman, which is something I fully understand, and ultimately leader of the party for nine of its 23 years in existence. Nigel has been UKIP's talisman and inspiration and its driving force. Through years of scorn and derision, then abuse and attacks, some of them physical, he has refused to be deflected from his mission. And, returning to the words of the Independent, Farage can now lay claim to having had a pivotal role in two of the most seismic events in Western political history. His cause in Europe is won, his man is in the White House. Love him or loathe him, he is somehow at the centre of American and European politics. Where he goes, furious change follows. Strange though it may be, few can argue that he is not the most influential man in Western politics. My lords, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome, for the very last time as the leader of UKIP, the man that Fox News calls the UK opposition leader, Nigel Farage. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Good morning, everybody. I've got a certain deja vu feeling about this morning because we were all here 
uh, a few months ago when I said that after uh, more than two decades um, of giving my life to UKIP party politics, the time had come to step back, the time had come to get my life back. And I thought that was that. We did go through a leadership election, but we didn't really get a new leader. So whoever wins today, I'm going to make absolutely sure that by the close of play tonight, they have signed the Electoral Commission documentation. <laughs> Yeah, they will be si the new leader will be signing this if necessary in blood, okay? It's, um, who's it going to be? You'll find out in a moment. I, it's not been the greatest few months for UKIP. I think the PR uh, that we've had has been pretty bad, and yet it hasn't really made much difference. Our support in the polls out there is still very, very solid. And I just thought for a minute I might reflect on what we've achieved. Do you know, since World War II, there have been scores of political parties set up in this country. Virtually none of them have ever gone anywhere. And yet we took UKIP, we took it to winning a national election in 2014, the first time since 1906, a party that wasn't Labour or Tory had won a national poll. We got it in a general election to nearly four million votes, which given the first past the post system was pretty stunning. We won a couple of parliamentary by-elections and above all, what we've really done is we've shifted the centre of gravity of British politics. It is quite some achievement. Whether it's being allowed to discuss immigration without being written off as being extremists, whether it's championing the idea of selective education to aid social mobility, whether it's being critical of the foreign aid budget, or whether, above all, it's about why we should not be part of a political union with the EU based in Brussels. On all of these areas and many more, when we first started to talk and started to campaign on these things, we were mocked and derided. The establishment political elite could not be rude, as rude about us even if they tried. The fact is we've done it and the fact is that without us there would not have been a referendum. Of that there is no question at all. And we played an absolutely crucial role in that referendum campaign. It is to my deep regret that certain slightly snobby Tories didn't want to work with us, but hey, that's life. I've seen a bit more of that in the last couple of weeks, haven't I? But either way, whichever group you supported or whether you supported both in that referendum campaign, the fact is that the ground campaign could not have happened without UKIP branches and UKIP members. And not only did we get that referendum, we played an absolutely crucial role in securing that great historic result on June the 3rd. So I thank all of you for that and all that you've done. And the result of that referendum, well, it's certainly been pretty seismic in terms of British politics, but I think I would argue it may just have had a bit of an effect on the other side of the Atlantic. Now, normally, normally when it comes to trends, be it social trends or political trends, uh, over the years you would think generally, you know, if New York catches a cold, then London sneezes. But in this particular amazing, transformative, and indeed in many ways revolutionary year of 2016, it is Brexit that directly led to the establishment getting beaten on the 8th of November and Donald J. Trump about to take the presidency. We were the inspiration behind much of that and I'm pleased for it. And across the rest of Europe too, be in no doubt 
that it is UKIP that is seen as the leading Eurosceptic group across the entire continent. It is UKIP that is the inspiration for Eurosceptic parties, both big and small, right across the continent. And it's UKIP's success in this referendum that says to people who don't normally bother to vote because they assume they're going to get beaten by the establishment. No, it's UKIP's achievement in getting and helping to win this referendum that says to voters across the whole of Europe, actually, if you go out there and you turn out, this rotten liberal establishment can be beaten. And I think... <laughs> for, those who, for those who think 2016 has been an awful year, and I, by the way, am not one of them. I've rather enjoyed most of it. But for those who think it's been an awful year, well, I'm sorry, folks. There's a lot more bad news to come. Uh, and it'll start next Sunday in Italy, where Renzi will probably lose that referendum. And my guess is uh, that it'll also happen in Austria next Sunday, where a candidate will win the presidency who is now committed to campaigning for Austria. To, have a, member, uh, to ha have a referendum on their membership of the Union. And then we roll in next year to elections in the Netherlands, in Germany and in France. And whilst the incumbents may just about hold on in all of those countries, the fact that this project is now fatally weakened, I have no doubt. But it, and it's our, I think, historic role to have shown people the way. So there is a lot more to come. And what have you kept? Well, of course, I was told when Mr Cameron gave the famous Bloomberg speech that the UKIP fox had been shot. There was no need for UKIP anymore because the Conservative Party were promising a referendum. It would be the end of UKIP and any potential electoral strength the party could have. And what happened, actually, by promising that referendum, what Cameron did, indeed, was to validate our position and make us go on to greater strength. And of course, in the wake of the referendum, we were told, well, that's it. It's all over. It's game up. UKIP is not needed anymore in British politics. They can pack their tents and they can go away. Well, I have to say, even if people did believe that to be true back in June or July, and even if the Prime Minister's initial words were enormously encouraging, which they were, weren't they? You know, Brexit means Brexit and all the rest of it. Uh, I think now the need for UKIP to be strong in the future is absolutely vital. And I think what has surprised a lot of people is that despite a difficult summer for the party, despite all of that, what the opinion polls show you is that if there was a general election tomorrow, four million people would still go out and vote UKIP, despite the difficult time that we've had. It is very difficult to get people to break away under a first-past-the-post system from their traditional tribal allegiances. There are lots of people out there who vote the same way as their grandparents voted 100 years ago. They see themselves to be a Labour family or to be a Conservative family. But once they've broken, once they've broken those bonds and come to UKIP, actually what's began to happen is they now see themselves as UKIP voters. They see themselves as UKIP families. And they believe that by switching their vote, they've actually played a part in their own way in making British history. And they're very happy, they're very pleased, and they're very proud about it. And I get all this stuff, I'm told, that UKIP voters are all old and all angry and all negative and all want to go back to the 1950s. They're all so imbued by pessimism. And yet the opinion poll in July, a big opinion poll of UKIP voters, showed that 86% of UKIP voters in July, post the referendum, were optimistic and upbeat and thought an independent Britain had a great future. There's no need for pessimism anymore in UKIP.
But there are two other factors that say that the new leader of UKIP inherits potentially a very strong position. The first is the party whose hierarchy have spent most of the weekend telling us what an absolutely wonderful and indeed awe-inspiring political giant Fidel Castro was. Not to worry about the thousands of people he killed, imprisoned, the lack of democracy. No, absolutely to Mr Corbyn's Labour Party, this man was a great shining hero. This Labour Party, led by a leader who refuses to sing the national anthem, and this Labour Party, who seemed to think, or at least they did till last week, that putting Diane Abbott on national television will somehow be good for their vote when, 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 with every sentence she utters about attitudes towards immigration, she basically abuses over half the traditional old Labour vote. Old Labour... <laughs> this Labour Party, this Labour Party offers nothing to old Labour voters who voted for Brexit. And if you look at the constituencies from the Midlands right up through the north of England, you see in seat after seat where over 50% of the Labour electorate voted for Brexit, they have MPs who have almost no sympathy with that position at all. Old Labour has absolutely nowhere else to go other than to come to UKIP. And I recommend that the next leader spends a lot of his time, I'm guessing it's going to be a he, but we'll see, um, spends a lot of his time focus I could be wrong. I could be wrong. I've been wrong before. I got Brexit right. I got Trump right. But I didn't get Leicester City. So there we are. And the third reason why UKIP not only potentially has a stronger electoral future than it's had in the past, but is equally vital to be there in the national interest is that so many of those high hopes we had in the early days of Theresa May's premiership um, are now beginning to look at best a little bit confused. You know, I saw the autumn statement last week. It was same old, same old. It wasn't an inspiring uh, you know, address, was it, for a country that had just made a big, radical, constitutional decision. We hear cabinet ministers saying, maybe we'll stay in the customs union. Maybe we'll stay in the single market and others that say that we won't. Now, I don't know exactly what's going to happen, but I do know this. Given that the Conservatives are 14 points ahead of Labour in the opinion polls, if there is not a significant electoral threat, and that can only, frankly, on this issue come from UKIP, then the chances are that at that referendum, what we voted for could get significantly watered down. That must not be allowed to happen. So the next leader of UKIP takes over a party that might have had a difficult couple of months, but is in a good, solid financial position, still maintains its base of four million votes in the polls, and I think everything is to play for. And I am happy and confident that I'm handing this over at a good time, albeit delayed by just a few months from what I wanted. As for me, what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to go on supporting UKIP. Am I going to be a backseat driver? No. Will I support the new leader of UKIP if they ask me to help? Yes. I intend to see out my time in the European Parliament, where I think, after Article 50, there may well be quite a lot of focus and quite a lot of attention. I will go on presenting radio shows and writing and doing some of the things I've developed over the course of the summer. And this week, I'm going off to the United States of America, but you'll understand purely as a tourist. Nothing more than that. I, I don't regret for one minute that I've devoted most of the best years of my adult life to building up this party and to fighting for this cause. It was the right thing to do. I'm proud to have done it. And I thank those, many of you, who've helped me over the last quarter of a century. And now is time 
I think we're going to have an announcement rather shortly, and now will be the time to get behind our new leader. From me, a big, big thank you. It's 50% done, all right? I've signed it. So we'll wait for a couple of minutes and get the other signature, and then it is done. Okay, my lords, ladies and gentlemen, we now move on to the main business of the day, uh, the, day the announcement of the result from the ballot to elect the new leader. Uh, there is, of course, something of Groundhog Day about this. When I took on the role of chairman from Steve Crowder on the 1st of August, it was on the understanding that I was just going to spend six weeks minding the shop over the summer, while we conducted an orderly election to replace Nigel. Since then, I've managed to preside over the resignation of four members of the NEC, the sad death of another, a small altercation in Strasbourg that you may have heard about, and subsequent investigation, the resignation of two MEPs and the departure of two leaders, one of them twice. Uh, even for UKIP, it has been somewhat beyond the norm. But on the other hand, I can't imagine a better time to have been in our party. We often say within the party that UKIP is lucky but lucky in the Confucian way, that the more you know, the luckier you are. Every few weeks, there's a new reason to predict that UKIP is going nowhere, has shot its bolts, is crashing to earth, or whatever. Some of them we provide ourselves. Yet unaccountably, since a dozen or so people created this mad project at the LSE 23 years ago, rumours of our demise have been regularly and consistently exaggerated. Yes, we may have had a rather Benny Hill-style summer, with some of our more senior members losing a grip of their horses. One or two have lost their nerve and have taken to the lifeboats. But let us just remember what has happened this year. UKIP have grown steadily, uh, steadily and inexorably in electoral influence, despite all the expert predictions frightening David Cameron into promising an in-out referendum on our EU membership. But not to worry everyone, they said, because those Eurosceptic nutters will never win. And then we won. The party so blithely dismissed by Mr Cameron in 2016 turned out to be sufficiently in touch with popular thinking that we had managed to persuade the largest ever popular vote in the UK to tell the establishment to stuff the arrogant insults and dire warnings and give us our country back. Just for reference. <laughs> Stunned silence all round, gradually it sunk in. And then the backlash started. The great and the good, plus other people like Tim Farron and Owen Smith, started putting it around that we didn't win fairly because the voters were too stupid to know what they were voting for. No one, except of course the whole Remain campaign on a daily basis, told us that we would have to leave the EU single market if we voted to leave the EU. Daily we were told that Leave voters were re regretting their decision in droves, despite the fact that the polls showed the opposite, and that the Leave campaign had pulled off some sort of dirty trick and fooled the electorate into losing their marbles, creating a political aberration. And it was incumbent upon the great and the good, and Tim Farron and Owen Smith, Lady Wheatcroft, Gina Miller, and Matthew Paris, to put everything right and the way it should be. I mean, as they said, who listens to UKIP, for heaven's sake? Look, there's that Farage hobnobbing with that ghastly man Trump. You see, we told you this is just a glitch. Normal service will be resumed as soon as we can line up the judges to make the exact opposite decision that they made in the Stuart Wheeler case and consign UKIP and all of its works to their richly deserved oblivion. And yet, today we find ourselves with President-elect Trump inviting Nigel Farage to be the first British politician that he meets.
And everyone who voted leave now knows that they are not a bunch of deluded, misinformed, ignorant numpties who are out of touch with the tide of history. Ladies and gentlemen, they are the tide of history. You are the tide of history. It's interesting that commentators on both the right and the left in the past fortnight have been saying almost exactly the same thing, in almost exactly the same words. The liberal, or if you're from the left, neoliberal consensus that has been driving so-called progressive internationalist Western politics for half a century is now broken. It has failed. It is being seriously rejected by ordinary voters in huge numbers. The, don't know the result yet, Jim. Stand, calm yourself. Uh, the Blairite idea that the Labour Party can be the political wing of the British people is finally exposed as the factuous and dangerous nonsense that it always was. There could never have been a more potent demonstration of why the people are now starting to rip back control from those self-appointed elites of why UKIP is so lucky and so necessary. With the Labour Party now led by some random combination of Jeremy Corbyn, John McDonnell and Gary Lineker, <laughs> the Liberal Democrats firmly re-establishing themselves as the supreme champions of the lost cause, and the Conservatives up to their neck in the task of renegotiating our independent nationhood, this is UKIP's time. All we need now is a new leader. And with this announcement, we now start a fresh chapter. Can I start by thanking Piers Walkop, who has overseen and acting as the returning officer for this election over the last few weeks. We sent out 32,757 ballot papers to members. We received back 15,405 ballot papers. The results of the election are, in third place, with 2,775 votes, or 18.1%, John Rees Evans. In second place, with 2,973 votes, or 19.3%, is Suzanne Evans. And therefore, the successful candidate and new leader of the UK Independence Party with 9,622 votes, 62.6% .6 of the vote, Paul Nuttall. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, what a wonderful uh, reception. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking uh, everyone uh, involved in the leadership election, particularly uh, the returning officer. It has been a well-run, fair and good-humoured contest. Indeed, one journalist said that it had been boring. Another said that it hadn't made much media attention. But actually, after the past couple of months that we've had, that's probably a good thing. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the members have spoken. The result is more than decisive. My call for unity has now received the biggest mandate in the history of our party.
and my new team will ensure that that mandate is swiftly put into effect. The key word in my last sentence was team, and I will build a team of all talents from all wings of the party. To that end, my first appointment is my deputy leader. He is someone who has backed my campaign and bought into my call for unity from the very beginning. Ladies and gentlemen, Peter Whittle. My second appointment is my party chairman. He's someone who has grown in stature during the summer months and has emerged from the shambles with his reputation enhanced. Ladies and gentlemen, Paul Oakden. My third appointment will be my principal political advisor. He is someone who I believe has one of the most perceptive and acute political brains in British politics today, Patrick O'Flynn. I will be making more announcements regarding appointments, both party officers and spokespeople, over the next 72 hours. However, there will be one theme, unity because only unity breeds success. People do not vote, join or donate to divided parties. So those within the party who want to come together and unite, I say, we have a great and successful future. To those who do not want to unify and want to continue fighting the battles of the past, then I'm afraid that your time in UKIP is coming to an end. I say this because, as I said in my conference speech back in September, uh, the party has resembled a jigsaw that has been tipped onto the floor. The events of last week simply highlight that fact. Today is the day that we start to put the UKIP jigsaw back together. It is day zero. It is a new beginning. And that means not only paying lip service to my call for unity, but it means practicing what we preach. It means all factions of the party coming together. It means bygones being bygones. It means being prepared to get round a table, talk and sort out our differences. Just as I saw it as my duty to stand in this election to bring us together, the party has a duty to unite those at the top of the party. Owe it not only to our membership, not only to the four million people who voted for us last year, but to the 17 and a half million people who went out and voted for Brexit. <laughs> the country needs a strong UKIP more now than ever before. For if UKIP ceases to be an electoral force, then there will be no impetus on Theresa May and her government to give us real Brexit. And what we will end up with is some sort of mealy-mouthed, backsliding version which doesn't allow us to control our own borders, which doesn't allow us to sign our own trade deals, which doesn't allow us to make all of our laws. Ladies and gentlemen, this will be a betrayal of the British people and a united UKIP under my leadership will never ever allow that to happen. We are engaged in a political tug of war at the moment over what kind of Brexit we will get. On one end you have the tired old establishment figures of Tony Blair John Major and Paddy Ashdown, who all want us to remain within the single market. And on the other end, there is UKIP, 
which is committed to enacting the will of the people. And that means taking back control, control over our borders, control over our finances, control over our laws. We will hold the government's feet to the fire electorally and ensure that Brexit really does mean Brexit. Great seems to be a word used quite a lot at the moment in politics. Indeed, Donald Trump spoke about making America great again. Under my leadership, we will ensure that this country gets the Brexit that it voted for on June the 23rd. And then we will put the great back into Britain. Do you know, ladies and gentlemen, it's amazing, isn't it, after the summer and autumn that we've had, that UKIP is still polling 13%. It is clear that there is a bank of people out there who are never going to return to the establishment parties. They are UKIP through and through. And look at the platform that we have. We have 20 MEPs, or we did last time I looked. We have an MP three members of the House of Lords, eight Assembly members, and most importantly, 500 councillors working hard in council chambers right across the country. And I say most importantly, because I see councils as the gateway to Westminster. We have a tremendous platform upon which to build and build we will, because there are open goals in British politics today. But UKIP has to be on the pitch to kick the ball into the back of the empty net. And that open goal is no more apparent than when it comes to the Labour Party. Today, the Labour Party has ceased to speak the language or address the issues of working people. They have a leader that will not sing the national anthem, a shadow chancellor who seems to admire the IRA more than he does the British Army, a shadow foreign secretary who sneers at the English flag, and a shadow Home Secretary who advocates unlimited immigration. They have lost touch. They are more at home talking about the issues that swirl around the Islington dinner party than the issues that matter in working class communities. So whilst Jeremy Corbyn and his Labour Party debate the Palestine question, fair trade and climate change, we instead will debate and talk about issues that concern real working people in real working class communities. We will continue to call for a fair but firm immigration control that protects wages and ensures that British workers are not undercut. We will we will call for sentences to mean what they say and promote policies that protect innocent victims and not career criminals. We will promote aspiration and social mobility and ensure that working class kids get the same start in life as their middle class counterparts. We will champion education by ability and not wealth. We will support the military to the hilt. We will commit to an increase in defence expenditure and ensure that our brave boys and girls in the armed forces have the best equipment possible. We will also honour the military covenant and ensure that those who are brave enough to put their lives on the line to protect this country are looked after when they return home. It's the least we can do. We will also be committed to protecting and investing in the National Health Service and slashing a foreign aid budget that is costing this country right now around £25 million every single day. We will also continue to talk about the issues that the other parties do not want to touch. We will not be afraid to say that female genital mutilation and forced marriage has no place in 21st century Britain.
and for that matter, neither do courts where the word of a woman is only half that of a man. Finally, whilst we as a party believe in the United Kingdom and are unionists to our fingertips, under my leadership we will champion a fair devolution deal for England and we will promote the English. I say this, I say this because there is a value that unites the vast majority of British people away from the small metropolitan clique and that value is patriotism. We fought the last election with a manifesto called Believe in Britain, and that is what the UKIP I will lead will continue to do. My ambition is not insignificant. I want to replace the Labour Party and make UKIP the patriotic voice of working people. We have achieved great things in the last five years and they should be celebrated. Uh, this was achieved under the inspirational leadership uh, of someone who's been my political mentor for many, many years now, uh, Nigel Farage. Please give him a round of applause. In 2014, we became the first political party since the Liberals in 1906 to win a national election outright that wasn't Labour or the Tories. In 2015, we garnered four million votes but only won one seat because of an outdated electoral system, which is another thing that has no place in Britain in the 21st century. But our greatest achievement, our greatest achievement and in my opinion, Nigel's greatest achievement was when in 2013 we forced the then British Prime Minister, David Cameron, into offering a referendum that he never wanted to give. This means, ladies and gentlemen, that our place in history is already secure. We were the party that forced the referendum and then we were the party that then helped and led to deliver Brexit. But for me, this is only the beginning of the story. As Winston Churchill said after hearing of the victory of Al Alamein, this is the end of the beginning. A new chapter for our party has opened today. And whilst we must celebrate our former glories, we must, we must not be a party that is content in looking backwards. We must look forwards into the final years of this decade with positivity and excitement. We must rebuild and restructure and get the party ready for the challenges ahead. My colleagues and friends, we've been on a fantastic journey together and I have been with you every single step of the way. From delivering leaflets in local by-elections in the rain to TV studios, from standing on street stalls on cold Saturday mornings to going on the airwaves, and from meetings in old smoky work and men's clubs in the early years to standing on this platform today. I have not just talked the talk with you, I have walked the walk. I have been your party chairman, I have been your head of policy, I have been the deputy leader, and I am so grateful and honoured today that the UKIP members have placed their faith in me as the leader. I will finish with what I have said at all the hustings. UKIP's future is bright, but for it to be so, UKIP must unite. And today's result has ensured that it will. There's a lot to do, ladies and gentlemen. There is a lot to do. My friends, my colleagues, my brothers and sisters in UKIP, let's get out there and let's get cracking. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, one last time for our new leader, please, Paul Nuttall. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that brings to a close our event this morning. Thank you very much for coming. Have a safe journey home and let's look forward to a bright future. Thank you very much. Like myself, he expected to simply be keeping the seat warm for a few weeks, in a period when nothing much was happening and he could carry on with his plans for a relaxing summer and autumn, visiting friends in the US and generally staying out of the limelight. <laughs> but it turned out not to be. Instead, he found himself described, by the Independent no less, as the most influential politician today. The Prime Minister apparently refuses to rule out awarding him a peerage and Graham Brady, the chairman of the Conservative backbencher, says that it is hard to justify not doing so. Though he himself has said that he's keen at the moment, he's not that keen at the moment, and might think about it when he gets old. He was recently portrayed on the cover of The Economist alongside Vladimir Putin and Donald Trump as a trio of drum-beating revolutionaries and his image was exhibited at the National Portrait Gallery, much to the disgust of the evening standards. He's been denounced by Jeremy Corbyn as a rich white man and by Matthew Paris for having killed his faith in democracy. Before he had even left, he has this week been tipped in some media for a political comeback in 2017, along with Tony Blair, who is apparently funding and founding a new not-for-profit organisation, which is lovely of him, to expand the impact of his work in devising solutions to some of the world's most significant problems, among which he includes Nigel Farage, I should expect. <laughs> the new statesman said that even without the vote for Brexit, Farage would have been one of the most transformative politicians of these turbulent times. And of course, the US president-elect has recently suggested that he may make an excellent ambassador to the United States. What do you think of that? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's not bad for a stand-in leader, is it? This really is our chance to say goodbye and thank you to a man who has personified this party. From its founding at the LSE in 1993, to the extraordinary position it finds itself in today. As a founding member of the party, its first by-election candidate and the first to retain his deposit, reluctant committee man, even more reluctant party chairman, which is something I fully understand, and ultimately leader of the party for nine of its 23 years in existence. Nigel has been UKIP's talisman and inspiration and its driving force. Through years of scorn and derision, then abuse and attacks, some of them physical, he has refused to be deflected from his mission. And, returning to the words of the independent, Farage can now lay claim to having had a pivotal role in two of the most seismic events in Western political history. His cause in Europe is won, his man is in the White House. Love him or loathe him, he is somehow at the centre of American and European politics. Where he goes, furious change follows. Strange though it may be, few can argue that he is not the most influential man in Western politics. It's about why we should not be part of a political union with the EU based in Brussels on all of these areas and many more. When we first started to talk and started to campaign on these things, we were mocked and derided. The establishment political elite could not be rude, as rude about us, even if they tried. The fact is, we've done it. And the fact is that without us, there would not have been a referendum. Of that, there is no question at all.
and we played an absolutely crucial role in that referendum campaign. It is to my deep regret that certain slightly snobby Tories didn't want to work with us, but hey, that's life. I've seen a bit more of that in the last couple of weeks, haven't I? But either way, whichever group you supported or whether you supported both in that referendum campaign, the fact is that the ground campaign could not have happened without UKIP branches and UKIP members. And not only did we get that referendum, we played an absolutely crucial role in securing that great historic result on June the 3rd. So I thank all of you for that and all that you've done. And the result of that referendum, well, it's certainly been pretty seismic in terms of British politics, but I think I would argue it may just have had a bit of an effect on the other side of the Atlantic. Now, normally, normally when it comes to trendation, <laughs> yeah, they will be si the new leader will be signing this if necessary in blood. Okay. It's, um, who's it going to be? You'll find out in a moment. I, it's not been the greatest few months for UKIP. I think the PR uh, that we've had has been pretty bad. And yet, it hasn't really made much difference. Our support in the polls out there is still very, very solid. And I just thought for a minute I might reflect on what we've achieved. Do you know, since World War II, there have been scores of political parties set up in this country. Virtually none of them have ever gone anywhere. And yet we took UKIP, we took it to winning a national election in 2014, the first time since 1906 a party that wasn't Labour or Tory had won a national poll. We got it in a general election to nearly four million votes, which given the first past the post system was pretty stunning. We won a couple of parliamentary by-elections and, above all, what we've really done is we've shifted the centre of gravity of British politics. It is quite some achievement. Whether it's being allowed to discuss immigration without being written off as being extremists, whether it's championing the idea of selective education to aid social mobility, whether it's been critical of the foreign aid budget, or whether above all... My Lords, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome, for the very last time as the leader of UKIP, the man that Fox News calls the UK opposition leader, Nigel Farage. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Good morning, everybody. I've got a certain deja vu feeling about this morning because we were all here uh, a few months ago when I said that after uh, more than two decades. Um, of giving my life to UKIP party politics. The time had come to step back, the time had come to get my life back. And I thought that was that. We did go through a leadership election, but we didn't really get a new leader. So whoever wins today, I'm going to make absolutely sure that by the close of play tonight, they have signed the Electoral Commission document